Welcome to the Primary Sources podcast from Viral History. My name is Joanne Paul, and I am here to chat with some of the world's leading historians, not just about what they do, the past worlds they uncover, but how they do it, and for goodness sake, why they do it. I'm interested in motivations and approaches and how they came to find themselves buried in the past in the first place. Today, I am very excited indeed to welcome archaeologist Natasha Bilson to the podcast. Natasha might be better known to listeners as Behind the Trowel, her social media presence, from which she hosts regular live shows, videos, and interviews. You might also recognize her, or at least her voice, from The Great British Dig, one of the many TV shows on which she's appeared as a presenter and expert. Welcome, Natasha, and thanks so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to dive into the world of history and archaeology. You're our very first archaeologist on the show, hopefully not our last. Um, I'm excited to get your perspective on uncovering the past um, from, from a very different sort of approach than, than what I might be used to. <laughs> no, I'm looking forward to this. And thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to be the first archaeologist. That's nice. <laughs> Well, I follow you on Instagram. I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, if you don't follow Natasha on, on Instagram, make sure that you do. Um, you've got a pretty steady stream of, of um, interviews that you do on there. And um, tell us a bit more about what you do on, on your Instagram account. Right. So I have two main platforms. I have Behind the Trail and I have Tash underscore Archeo as in archaeology, but the, the European way of spelling it. Um, so it's got that silent A in it. <laughs> And I found that, especially over the last year with COVID, um, I noticed that there was a gap uh, where archaeologists were kind of really disappointed that they could not go in their field schools in the summer. And I kind of had like this light bulb moment where I was like, hang on, there are a lot of individuals at home now who have research that they want to share, but they don't know how to share it. So I was like, I'm going to start messaging them. So I slid into their DMs <laughs> and I was like, hey, would you like to... Uh, come on my live stream show. I'm, I'm doing something I've never done before. And that's where Archaeologists in Quarantine came about. And that's on YouTube as well as Instagram. And sometimes on Facebook as well, we stream simultaneously. That sounds very familiar to exactly what I'm doing <laughs> right now <laughs> as well. Um, and why there are so many podcasts out there. And I just thought it was a great excuse too to chat with some of my friends and people that I admire um, on, on a podcast. So I'm sure you find the same with, with your Instagram as well. It definitely is. I found that I connected with people I don't think I would have um, if this pandemic had happened. I do find most of us actually connected with each other in a way I don't think we would have had the opportunity before because of time and, and the, the wanting to. And apologies in advance, you can hear my cat running around in the background. <laughs> we talk a lot on this podcast about where the love of the past started for people. Do you have an early memory of being really engaged by history? I remember when I was about seven years old, I came across this book about Tutankhamun at school, in the school library. And there was a passage there about, there was an individual who uncovered it, a chap called Howard Carter, and he was an archeologist. And I was like, hmm, what is that? <laughs> and that's where it was, that, that word stuck with me. And I remember going through Britannica encyclopedias, researching about archeology, span and then I came across maritime archeology span and I was like, wow, there is there's so much I could do. And it just stuck, that memory really stuck with me and here I am. <laughs> Were you digging up things in your garden or anything as a child? Did you go on any early little digs? Oh yeah, um, the family remember me digging in everybody's back garden, finding pens and two pence coins and being so excited by it. Um, I remember my grandmother spent like a year looking for a metal detector for me, um, just so I could go in the garden and metal detect. Like it was crazy. They, they got scared of leaving me alone actually in the garden. They didn't know what they would come back to. <laughs> you were a raccoon messing up the, the flower pots. <laughs> Yes, I am. I am still a raccoon. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about the ancient world that you found so fascinating? You said it was Egypt and, and a maritime archaeology, which I assume is sort of the Mediterranean, or what was it about that very ancient world that really struck you? It was something so unique in itself, being able to have that contrast within just reading a book. And I was like, wow, what is that? And then looking in the museums and seeing the material culture left behind, I just could not get over the fact that something like this tool could be 4,000 years old. 
and we have something similar right now in the kitchen. Really? <laughs> you know, like a knife, like the concept yeah. of a knife, you know, like it just, just so fascinating for me when you look at stone tools mm -hmm. and then how that transpires into what we have in the kitchen, literally just something so simple. Mm -hmm. What's some, your favorite museum to visit in the UK? That's a really hard one. It depends what mood I'm in. <laughs> I'll tell you why, because there are, of course, most museums in the UK are free mm. starters, which I love. I it's love amazing. Com coming over from Canada, I was like, I'm sorry, I don't have to pay for the British Museum. I, I, I don't understand this concept. It's amazing. Well, this is the thing. I didn't realize how lucky we had it in that sense until I started traveling. And I was like, why am I paying like 15 euros, 20 euros? There was like $26 to go into Ontario Museum. And I was like, why am I paying this much? <laughs> Like, it should be free. This is like, this is, you know, world history, world heritage. We should be able to see it for free, in my opinion. Um, so being able just to walk into the British Museum and be immersed by, by world history, world culture, world heritage, for me, having those opportunities really um, continued my fascination and love for archaeology. It's so important. I remember, um, I think it was Friday nights, you mentioned the Royal Ontario Museum. I think it was Friday nights, it was cheaper for, for students or something like that to, to go along. And I remember I would, I would save up my money <laughs> and then on a Friday night go, because it was cheaper. It, it is a real amazing privilege um, over here that, that museums are free, most of them anyway, and that you can just go in and, and you are a testament to the effect that that can have um, inspiring young people. Did you study archaeology um, through school and, and into uni then? So at school, I just did geography and history. I always had that passion for those two subjects in particular. I remember it from really one of my youngest memories at school is a history lesson, history class. So I've always stuck with it. Um, and during sixth form, so college, as we see in the UK, um, I didn't have the opportunity to do archaeology as, as an A-level, but I did archaeology, I did history and geography. And then from that, I went and did my undergraduate at Bournemouth University and I did an archaeology Bachelor of Science. Was there a moment where you considered doing history or was it always definitely archaeology? There was a time actually, because I'd never met an archaeologist before. I'd never spoken to one. I didn't know really like who they were, what they did, what they were like. But um, something just about archaeology, and I remember reading the syllabus, and I was like, I want to do this. I want to have both the, the theoretical and the practical understanding of it. How do you see the relationship between archaeology and history? I mean, it's, it's, it's like bread and butter. You need both. <laughs> you need both. But for me, I do find archaeology in a way as somewhat redefining history or the way we interpret a historical source. Um, sometimes even like uh, the uh, trajectory of a Roman road that we have in London, once we start doing archaeological excavations, actually we're like, oh no, it went this way and not this way. So sometimes it's, this is like the sort of, uh, I love history, of course, but I just find archaeology a bit more interesting <laughs> you do something more about it you know like every day you're constantly learning and every day you don't know what you're going to find and in theory i know historians say the same thing when they're looking through historical texts and when they're comparing manuscripts or something it can redefine their understanding but i kind of feel that like archaeology is just a bit more you know cherry on top sort of thing <laughs> the material reality isn't it you can't really argue with as you say that the road actually went west instead of east at that point um and I was just thinking through the implications of something like that as a historian, because we spend all this time theorizing and maybe it meant that and maybe the implications are this, but a, a, an actual change like that would, I mean, the number of articles that would come out, <laughs> come out because of that one uh, um, discovery that an archeologist makes is, is huge. What do you wish historians understood better about archeology? span we are a science, we're constantly evolving. Our interpretations are constantly changing and we don't have necessarily the control over that. It's what happens when we do our work. And the fortunate and unfortunate truth about what I do, which is field archeology, span is that it's quite intrusive. So once it's gone, it's gone. So we're documenting as much as we can in the space and the time frame that we have. 
because that's what we want to do and that's our passion and um, just being able for others to understand that we are academics as well we are uh, somewhat uh, like a historian we're just approaching uh, material culture in a different way we're basically the same just slightly different interests really do you wish there was a closer working relationship between history and archaeology or maybe there's a closer one that I'm not aware of I'm trying to think actually in a way though when we do something called death-based assessments so we're looking at the archaeological significance or um, the impact that a potential development could have we're looking at historical resources as well we were honing in on those skills in itself we're looking at the geography and that we're looking at other uh, scientific disciplines to help us understand what's going on so i feel like it is an interdisciplinary subject and a study in itself so maybe yeah we could work together more of course we could. Um, if there was time and resources, I'm sure we would do that. And there are certain situations, I think more so in the university or maybe even a museum setting where there are opportunities to work together. Whereas what I do, I don't think there is as much. We're just kind of doing it by ourselves in a way. One of the things that you do is, is this outreach to try to encourage people, children as well as adults to do archeology, span to understand archeology, span Tell me a little bit about your, your view, your mission, your vision in terms of your outreach. Wow, that's such a big question. <laughs> I'll try and get it as concise as possible. The main goal for me is to disseminate information to as many people as possible, to get rid of that jargon that comes across in academic journals and papers and books, textbooks, why is textbooks three, 400 pages? You know, like it's so difficult to comprehend a whole research of an individual, which is why I try to do outreach. I try to condense that information into bite sized bits that are more palatable for everybody to understand. I may be accused of simplifying something, but I'd rather simplify it and get more people to be like, oh, I'm interested in that. I would like to do further reading. You know, like my videos, I put the sources, I put recommended textbooks to read or recommended videos. And that's just one avenue that I try to approach. Getting people interested in the past, I mean, and, and letting people take control of the narrative a bit more. Because in my mind, and what I see online, pseudoscience is like the biggest threat against our institutions. And we as a community need to work together do things like this, podcasts, videos, and so on. Create more information out there is, that is just as exciting, but actually real and factual and nonfiction. Um, so it's, it's, it's doing that. And then on the flip side as well, I try to visit schools when I can. Before COVID, I would go and visit the local schools around my area and I would do talks. I must admit, I hated it because I don't like, oh my God, children scare me um, because they're just like, you don't know what they're going to ask you, you know, yeah. and they're just looking at you like, hmm. You can just see them staring as you're given your presentations. Yeah, there's um, a sense of impress me. Yeah, they're literally like, why should I care about what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the harshest critics. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> but um, there's something so magical, I think, about being able to, to tell the past, to create a story and to communicate it in a concise way. But it's not easy. <laughs> It strikes me as so similar what you're saying to what I've uh, heard some of the other people I've interviewed for this um, podcast saying, and they would define themselves um, at least partially in, in some of the work that they do as public historians. And I think there is a very prominent role, especially in the UK for public historians and there's magazines and shows and podcasts and everything else. Would you define yourself as a public archeologist? It's always been my end goal to be a community archeologist or public archeologist, they're kind of like basically the same term, it just depends who you're talking to. That's always been my goal, but it's been so hard to get a job in that area. Um, literally one person in a company, if that will be assigned that position. So I kind of took it into my own hands and that's why I kind of went on social media and was like, I'm just gonna do what I can do in my spare time. <laughs> what part does travel play in your work? And understanding of course that there have been limitations on that in the last year or so. <laughs> Well, wow, I've been able to travel the world. I have. And looking back at my experiences, I'm thinking, wow, what did I do? Where did I go? Knowing little information or not knowing any language, you know, no language skills. Like, cause I didn't, I wasn't able to speak Russian and I flew to Siberia and then I learned a bit whilst I was there. Um, 
those experiences kind of define me as an individual, but also my archaeological experience of how we interpret deposits, how we excavate something, it, it varies from country to country. So I actually think it's very important for any archaeologist out there, or really anyone in any field of study or experience in general, I think we need to travel and meet others who are doing the same, but in their way and, and in how they approach the past. So I would say I've enjoyed traveling. However, uh, most of my professional archaeology career has been based in the UK. So for the past eight years, I've been working in commercial archaeology. And even though I would say I'm predominantly in London, I've, I've literally traveled across the UK because I don't have a choice where I go. I'm just told. <laughs> I get a call. I need you to go, you know, 400 miles from where you are right now tomorrow. I'm like, great. Okay. How long am I there for? Maybe a day, maybe a week. I turn up and I'm there for three months. Like this is how <laughs> random and sporadic my life is <laughs> as an archaeologist. So travel is quite important. <laughs> you always have a bag packed, ready to go. Always, yeah. always like the A-team. <laughs> Thinking again about this comparison between the disciplines of archaeology and history, when a historian sees an artifact, it's usually after it's been restored, catalogued, it's frequently far from the place it was uncovered. Um, we've talked on this podcast before about um, power in the archives and the way in which that becomes a filter for interpreting the past. What does that immediacy, when you get to uncover an artifact and see it in the place where it was, without all that work being done on it, what does that immediacy bring to your understanding of the past? Well, first of all, being able to unearth something that hasn't been seen for hundreds or thousands of years, it's, yeah, you're literally yeah. mind-blowing. <laughs> so when you get over that and you start to think, okay, this is, I'm working right now. <laughs> this is my job. I can't get too excited over this one small fragment of pottery or this archaeological deposit that might be Roman plaster floor. You have to get over that and do the job in the time frame you have. So there comes a point where even though you're so interested in what you're doing, you have to remember there are deadlines to meet. There's paperwork you have to do and you just got to push through. So there's definitely something where if you're lucky enough and you get to do the post excavation, which means you're kind of generally speaking in the office, you could be processing the finds. So you might be even washing them at the beginning, letting them dry. Then you write on the back their special number. We have context numbers, we have a site code. So we know the location and the actual archeological deposit it came out from. That's a process in itself. So being able to handle the objects within that time frame, from unearthing it to preparing it for archives, I do feel like we have a different, um, not approach, but I think it means something a little bit different to us because in a way we're just seeing that one artifact. We're not seeing the whole picture. So our, our mindset at the time is like, wow, look at this, look at this, this is amazing. But actually when you have somebody who's writing the report, they're thinking not just about that find, they're thinking about everything. So their approach is gonna be different. And then there's gonna be someone who reads this report in 10 years time, who will be honing in on that report and other reports to create another hypothesis. So I think along the way, the, the significance of something or the, the pure dazzlement of something changes as the hands touch it, so to speak. You're talking then about the paperwork that's required. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, you've spoken before about um, the dangers of archaeology becoming too glamorized, um, that the reality of it is maybe different than our idea of it watching, you know, Indiana Jones or The Mummy or whatever it might be. How do you sell people on archaeology as a career and a discipline without falling into the trap of overly glamorizing it? That's a really hard, fine line. Really, really difficult. And I found myself at one point, I remember it was like in March last year and I was exhausted. It was like towards the end of March and um, you know, COVID had kicked in, restrictions had to come in. We had to drop the field team by half. We still had the same amount of time and we had so much pressure and so much work to do in, in the very short time that we had. Whilst the pandemic was, was all over the news, everywhere we could go. And I remember just thinking, wow, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna record how I'm feeling right now. And I did it and I put it online. I said, look, this is the reality of commercial archaeology. There are good days and then there are bad days. 
and it's being able to see both sides because we very rarely see the truth of of any field in general of, of any job like does do people actually show you the positives and negatives probably not because they want you to do the job as well and it's okay i think to actually show that this this is this may happen to you you may feel like this but it's okay you will get over it so actually i try my best to show the realities whether that's good or bad and, and let people know it's mentally and physically exhausting. However, there are so many different avenues to take and there is something for everybody in archeology. span You're not just digging. There are so many other avenues you can, you can go down. I think there's like 85 career paths I heard recently. So it's being able to, to show that and, and let archeologists who specialize in different areas to give them a platform to speak. And that's what I try to do. In terms of empowering people to explore different avenues in archaeology, the Great British Dig is all about communities getting involved in digging up the past. How do we all become amateur archaeologists in our own back gardens? Oh, memories of filming. <laughs> <laughs> it's for me, and I hope it came through in the show, that there are so many different opportunities you can take to become an amateur archaeologist as long as you are in contact with archaeologists, then it's okay in, in my mind, yeah? Um, and if you're gonna find something and you find an artifact or you think you find something structural that you think is old, you contact PAS, yeah? The Portable Antiquities Scheme. Uh, you can find that online, so P-A-S, just Google it, and you'll be able to find a finds liaison officer. And by telling them, then that's, that's the key for us. So you can be an amateur archeologist, you can explore what's in your back garden, but if you think you find something, just tell us. So we can then come in if we think it's significant or it might not be, but at least you know you can communicate with us and you can reach out to us on Facebook, for example, on Badger, which is B-A-J-R. Um, there's a large community there and we, we will be able to tell you what's going on and give you advice if you think you find something. Um, or you can contact your local archaeological unit, so archaeological company that is, and you can ask, is there a, an opportunity for me to dig? Or is there a community dig going on? Do I have to pay? Because there are, there are two, two types of community excavations, some that you pay for, others just ask for volunteers. Um, it really does depend where you live. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities pre-COVID, there were a lot of opportunities to get involved in one way or another. Um, I do recommend uh, Intertidal Archaeology. Uh, they literally work along the coast and they have this really fun app called Citizen. And uh, you can document kind of what's on what you see on the shore. So it's really cool. There's so many different ways you can get involved in archaeology. Of course, there's an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna move on to our quick fire questions now. Um, so uh, just a handful of questions, answer off the top of your head to the best of your ability, but feel free to give us an explanation as well. What is the most unglamorous dig you've ever been on? The most unglamorous would have to be ones where I'm, I am in full asbestos gear. <laughs> Always in the heat waves. That's where you find me in full PPE every time. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I was imagining a mud pit with rain, but yeah, that, that does sound worse. <laughs> it is worse. <laughs> when, when does that happen? Why, why would you have to wear full PPE for a dig? Right. So generally speaking, we are in full PPE. We might actually have to wear like literally imagine a general contractors on site. So full orange or full yellows. And um, depending with where long sleeved hive is, it just depends. Each site has their own health and safety protocols. Um, large infrastructure jobs, you have to wear full PPE all the time you're in. So you can't tell who's an archaeologist and who's not, basically. Most of the time you're on a site, you don't know who's who um, until you see them working in their areas. So there's full PPE, asbestos gear comes in when we think we have asbestos on site or we're told there is asbestos on site, but we have to get our job done. So we have to be in full PPE and just get on with the task. Is that like a full helmet and everything if there's asbestos? Are you, are you sort of like a marshmallow man? We're kind of like, uh, so asbestos gear is like a hazmat suit. Yep. <laughs> complete hazmat suit. Sometimes um, people have large, like they kind of look like gas masks, like old school gas masks, but they're not. They're just like respiratory equipment. Um, so it really depends on the situation you're in. Other times you could be in confined spaces. You could be working in the tunnel. So you have to carry the um, like oxygen, oxygen tank with you. Like it's just crazy the things that we do and people don't even know about it. 
So when you were told you had to wear a mask in a shop, it was, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, which one do I want to wear? Yeah. <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> what would you say is your holy grail? What do you dream about being the one to discover? Oh, that's a really hard one as well, because again, it depends on what mood I'm in. <laughs> you'll notice a lot of archaeologists say you could be on the best site the best archaeological site but it could be the worst like weather or the worst team to work with it really is down to who you're working with that makes the the job fun um and it's kind of potluck if you get on with the team or not but generally speaking you're going to get on with the team everyone's pretty much the same uh we laugh at the same things we have similar humor and we run on coffee tea and cakes so that's all you need to give us to make us happy <laughs> and what is the coolest thing you've ever found well I, I'll tell you my favorite site my favorite site was in Shoreditch and it kind of sums up the holy grail mixed with my favorite like the coolest thing I found for me it was um the largest collection of Westminster tiles outside of Westminster that we found in Shoreditch and they were beautiful and actually it's like one of my favorite it's just my favorite dig for so many different reasons I just love being able to see the transition from one time period to another and to see it structurally as well so you can look at the church foundations then you can see later on that's been demolished and then you've got like a Elizabethan fireplace and then that's been demolished and then all of a sudden you have a 1960s concrete piling coming through like just crazy the things that you see in such a small space so it's really hard sometimes to choose because everything is unique yeah well and it's it's the combination of things rather than the individual thing that sort of makes it isn't it exactly. do we know do we know why the tiles were in shortage oh, it was just at that time so at that time that was the fabric and this church was quite quite posh ah. yeah they had a lot of money and that's the reason why it was just that style of that time period and it just happens to be that we see the same tiles in Westminster and they were coined the term Westminster tiles I understand thank you <laughs> what is the first place you want to visit once travel restrictions lift? Oh, to be honest, I'd love to go back to Ukraine. Um, I had a dig I was supposed to do there last year, couldn't go. And then again, this year, they're asking when I come and I'm like, I don't know, but I'd really like to explore the Yamana culture in Hortska Island in Zaporozhia. <laughs> like, I really would like to go there, <laughs> but I don't know. So hopefully I'd like to go back to Ukraine. So what is the dig there? Are you allowed to say? The most fascinating thing for me is to be able to explore the uh, Yamana culture, which is these really cool sort of pit grave cultures or okra grave cultures. Kind of imagine like these stone circles, but like really small, like kurgan, so they're stones piled on top of each other. So it's kind of that aspect. But it's also like steppe culture, which is something that I'm super fascinated in. Um, but this particular site is from around, uh, I think, 3,300 BC to... 2600 BC. Wow. I think it's around that time period. Um, so it's just, just fascinating. I just love exploring the world really. Um, and through archaeology, I think it's the, the best way to do it. Last quick fire. What is the coolest thing that someone has discovered in their back garden with your help? Okay. So during the Great British Dig, um, we had an episode where we were in Massam, Yorkshire, the purpose of the dig was to, to find out the extent of the cemetery site. And we had a feeling that some gardens may have human remains. So it was kind of ask and then say, look, there might be human remains here. Are we able to investigate it? And the thing about this town was they all knew about their local history. So they were all really excited to be involved in some shape or form. And uh, what you see in the, the TV show is that... <laughs> we actually found um, remains of, of two individuals in the pub garden of the Bruce Arms. Um, so that was honestly like such an unusual situation for me as a commercial archaeologist where I'm just used to being on construction sites and I'm literally in a pub garden, not there for a drink, I'm there on an excavation and, and we found two, two individuals and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, archaeology is literally beneath your feet, but uh, you don't think that when you're going for a drink or meeting up with friends for dinner, do you? I will now. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what period they were from, the remains? I think um, they're probably around 10th century. 
Wow. Yeah. That's... But they would have done the the analysis on it by now. But at the time, probably from what we know from previous excavations, it's around 10th century. Amazing. All right. I'm going to end with the same three questions I ask all of my guests. These aren't quick fire, um, so you can breathe a little. Um, the question I usually ask is, what is your favorite primary source that you've ever worked on? Um, but I'm going to change that for historic artifact. And it's really the same thing. Oh, so what's that my favorite in general? Um, I do recently, I do like a bottle. I love bottles and stoneware vessels. I don't know what it is, but it's, I'm, I'm loving them at the moment. Are they able to tell you specific things that other things can't tell you? I just love the fact that actually, I changed my mind already, maybe clay tobacco pipes. This is the problem now, <laughs> I have too many choices. I just love seeing decoration. That's what it is. I love being able to see the, the maker's mark and clay tobacco pipes uh, on, bottles and stoneware. Generally speaking, you see the maker's mark. Uh, for me, that's what's really cool. What are you working on next? And I guess the question there is, what's your next big dig? <laughs> I can't really tell you, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the thing about archeology. span uh, Unfortunately, we, you know, we have this uh, client confidentiality that we must keep and it actually makes a social media and public engagement quite difficult unless you're on a site that gives permission or they have it in their quota so to speak they need to give this information publicly whilst the, whilst we're working there we can't say what we're doing and that's just that's just how it is but it protects the archaeology so that's why what's the, what's the danger if you talk about it well i mean in the news recently it was a prime example of what happens to us um, on a daily basis um if we're there, of course, either in the evenings when we're not on site or in the weekends when we're not working. Uh, night hawkers might come in. So these are guys who are chaps, I should say, who are coming with metal detectors, um, just digging holes. So they're, they're literally metal detectoring and they're just digging wherever they get the, the sound. Yeah, wherever it beeps, they will dig down. And that interferes with the archaeological deposits. And I remember working on a road scheme last year. Um, and unfortunately, even with the security that we had, like we had the fencing up and everything like that, they still got in. So it is, it's really, it's really like, it's not scary, but it's really sad, actually, that sometimes you come on site and you know someone's been there and they, they've touched some, you know, they've touched history, they've tampered with history and it's, it's just annoying. <laughs> well, especially you work so hard to preserve the dig, even as you are digging, to have someone else come in and, and ruin that is, is, it was devastating a little bit, isn't it? It is, because for us, this is not, it's not just our work or it's not just our hobby and our passion. We're doing science, you know, this is scientific analysis that we're doing and once it's gone, it's gone. So it's frustrating when, when others come and tamper with it. It really is. Well, then I, I won't push you on your next thing for <laughs> sure then. <laughs> Last question. What advice would you give to a historian just starting out from the point of view of an archaeologist? Get as much experience as possible. Explore the different avenues there are. And hopefully you'll find something that interests you. You're going to find something that really, when you wake up, you want to research or you want to learn more about it. Um, do what you love because we work most of our life unfortunately so you've got to do what you love and you've got to be happy with what you're doing so find something that you're interested in and it's okay to change careers as you're going along so it's okay to change your interests that's normal that's a part of growing up um, in the world of what you do as a historian or an archaeologist in general um, there's no straight route uh, it's a long and windy route to your final destination so enjoy it Thank you so much, Natasha, for helping us dig through the past. Thank you for having me. Just a reminder, if you want to hear more conversations with history makers like Natasha Bilson, do subscribe to Primary Sources Podcast and follow us and Viral History on Instagram and Twitter, where you can also suggest future guests and send along quick fire questions to grill them with. Thank you for listening to Primary Sources. Primary Sources.